Hello, everybody. Welcome into Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Jeremy Lapidus. Today is Thursday, September 19th, and we have a huge day ahead in the world of sports. It's the final day of the regular season in the WNBA. We have a tiebreaker alert trying to determine the final seed in the playoffs between three different teams. The dream currently hold that spot with one game up ahead of the Chicago Sky and the Washington Mystics. We'll talk about all of the different scenarios there. We will also cover the Pac-12. Will they be a Power 5 team, Power 5 conference, when they enter into play in 2026, as well as a Thursday night preview and more? But before we get into all of that, remember, if you would like to be an even bigger part of the show than you already are, all you need to do is go to gsmcpodcast.net. Or if you are on YouTube, you can use that super chat feature. If you do either of those two things, a message should pop up on the bottom of the screen for you, me, and everybody else around the world to see. If you do have a burning question about sports, anything at all that you would like to ask, go ahead and throw that in the comments, throw it in the chat. I will get to it as soon as I possibly can. I appreciate everybody so much for sticking around, talking some sports with me here on a beautiful Thursday, September 19th. But like I was saying in this segment here, we are going to start off with the NFL Hall of Fame class, and more specifically, one of the new members. The way that the NFL Hall of Fame class, the nominees, have been announced, there's a bunch at every single position, but the way it works is five years after you retire, you're eligible to enter into the NFL Hall of Fame. This year, we have a relatively controversial one, one that's been argued for a very long time. Eli Manning. Eli Manning is officially up for the Hall of Fame for the first time, and this one is going to be controversial. He is with a pair of ten of nine other quarterbacks that are currently up there, along with all the other positions. Uh, joining Eli Manning in that quarterback class, potentially, Mark Bolger, Randall Cunningham, Jake DeLome, Doug Flutie, Rich Gannon, Jeff Garcia, Donovan McNabb, Steve McNair, and Tony Roma. Out of those guys, and it doesn't always work like this where there's one quarterback in every class, but quarterbacks generally find a way to sneak in. I think Eli Manning is at the top of that hill. You can make a couple of different arguments, maybe Tony Romo, maybe Randall Cunningham, maybe Donovan McNabb, but there aren't too many quarterbacks that are better than Eli Manning. This is a question of, is Eli Manning a Hall of Famer? And to answer that one, absolutely, I think he is. I think there's no doubt in my mind that Eli Manning is a Hall of Fame player. Now, might be a little biased coming from me as a Giants fan here, but I don't think there's a way you can look at what he's done. Two-time Super Bowl MVP, top 10 in yards all time, top 10 in touchdowns all time, top 10 in all of those important quarterback stats all time and not think of him as a Hall of Famer. Where the question gets more interesting and where I'm willing to give an inch is on whether or not he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. Now, in my personal opinion, I think he is. I think what he's done for the game of football, I think his numbers and how great of a player he was for how long of a career he had, his Iron Man streak that if, you know, hadn't if he hadn't been benched for one random game would have been the longest of all time his competitiveness and his consistency i think makes him a first ballot hall of famer but i do understand the argument why not right he's a guy that only won 50 percent of his games again quarterbacks winnings are not a quarterback stat i will die on that hill wins are a team stat in every single sport we talk about it in baseball, too. Wins. Wins are not a pitcher stat. Wins are a team stat. And it's dumb that that's an argument, in my opinion. If that is your best argument against Eli Manning, that his team only won 50% of the games he was in, that's stupid. That's dumb. I don't think that has a leg to stand on. Now, if you're going to come in with an argument saying, oh, but he threw a million interceptions, yeah, he threw a lot of interceptions. You know who leads the world in interceptions all time? It's Brett Favre. Brett Favre, Hall of Fame quarterback, Brett Favre. There is a, there's, there's an argument against him, and I completely understand it. I really do. 
he was bad in the last couple years of his career and he kept it going longer than he should then lo not longer than he should have but for a little while for a longer longer than his prime and i think that's left a bad taste in people's mouths but i don't think there is a world where eli manning doesn't make the hall of fame and if the biggest arguments that i've seen are his wins which are a team stat his interceptions which to be honest who cares who really cares if he threw a lot of interceptions, that's that's a stat that's going to happen with accumulation. You know, it's just it's one of those things that you look at. And I don't really see a good argument why he isn't in the hall of why he shouldn't be a Hall of Famer and why he shouldn't be a first ballot Hall of Famer. People are going to say it's because his name. People are going to say, oh, it's because he's a Manning. But he not only was he a Manning, but he was a great quarterback in this league. And I believe he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. Outside of him, let's take a look at the running backs real quick. There's a lot of running backs here, but there's a couple of them that I want to highlight. Sean Alexander, Priest Holmes, Eddie George, some of these guys that have been on here for a while. Marshawn Lynch is a, is up for it this year as well. There are a couple of running backs that I think have a real shot. Fred Taylor was a finalist last year, didn't end up making it. Maybe this is the year he gets in. Darren Sproles is an interesting one. Kick returner, punt returner, running back. And I think the it's a question of how much we value special teams, right? There's a lot of really, really good special teamers. And we saw uh, Devin Hester get in to the Hall of Fame last year. We got to see Devin Hester get in, which I don't think he should have, honestly. I think there's a lot of other guys that would have taken over him that are currently in that wide receiver class. Torrey Holt, who was a finalist last year. Steve Smith, who I don't know why he's not a Hall of Famer yet. You know, Reggie Wayne, also a final finalist last year. There's a lot of really great wide receivers out there. Rod Smith, Demarius Thomas, although I'm not really sure if Demarius Thomas is a guy that will get in. I just don't know if his career was long enough. Brandon Marshall, Chad Johnson, some of these guys deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. You know, there's a lot, again, a lot of really good options. There's so many good players. There's only so many that can get in every single year. And we're going to have this discussion. These guys have more chances to get in, but, you know, only so many can. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Who do you think gets into the NFL Hall of Fame? Do you think Eli Manning is an NFL Hall of Famer? Again, let me know in the comments. We're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, we're going to shift our attention out of the NFL for a little bit and take a look at the WNBA. Lots of craziness going on over there as a battle for the eighth seed concludes tonight, the final night of the regular season. It's a three-way race. We'll talk about all the different scenarios, what might happen, and how these teams got here. So stick around for that. We'll be right back here on Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. Welcome back to Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Jeremy Lapidus. Today is Thursday, September 19th. Hope everybody is having a wonderful day so far. In the last segment, if you're just tuning in, 
we just finished talking all about the Hall of Fame class of the NFL, how Eli Manning is on the ballot for the first time, whether or not he is a first ballot Hall of Famer. In this segment, we're going to switch gears, talk a little bit about the WNBA. The final game of the regular season is tonight. There is a three-way battle for that last spot in the playoffs between Atlanta, Washington, and, of course, Chicago. These three teams are in a, uh, have very high stakes tonight. All three games are going to take place at 7 p.m. tonight, so nobody knows the outcome of either one beforehand. We'll break down how each team got here, who I think is going to get that final spot, and more. But before I do that, remember... If you would like to be an even bigger part of the show than you already are, all you need to do is go to gsmcpodcast.net. Leave a tip or donation with a message in it, or if you are on YouTube, you can do the exact same thing with the Super Chat feature. If you do either of those two things, a message should pop up on the bottom of the screen for you, me, and everybody else around the world to see. If you do have a burning question about sports, anything at all that you would like to ask, Go ahead and throw that in the comments. Throw it in the chat. I will get to it as soon as I possibly can. I appreciate everybody so much for sticking around, talking some sports with me here on a beautiful Thursday, September 19th. But like I was saying, we are going to get into the WNBA. The WNBA is a is having its best season ever, just point blank, period. A lot of that is because of one Caitlin Clark, but there's still some drama there at the bottom for the eight seeds specifically. We are interested in what's going to happen. It is currently a three horse race with the Atlanta dream leading by one game over both the Washington mystics and the Chicago sky right now. As we look at it, obviously for the Atlanta dream, it's win and in they're up one game on the rest of the teams. If they're able to take down the number one seeded New York Liberty tonight in New York, they will get that final playoff spot. Now, every other team has clinched, so there is a chance that the Liberty do not play all of their starters, which would give Atlanta a huge leg up there. As far as I know, and as far as has been publicized so far, we do not know who is starting and who is not. Nothing has come out yet for the the Liberty, so that's going to be an interesting question. Again, these are all teams that are playing for their playoff lives. This is going to be a very, very good game. That Liberty team is awesome. 32-7, and led by Sabrina Ionescu. This is a very, very good team. There's a reason that they're the best team in all of of the WNBA. Of course, also having Breonna Stewart on that team as well. They take on the Atlanta Dream at 7 tonight, but the other two teams, the ones that are one game behind are in very interesting positions. We'll start with the Chicago Sky. They've been very publicized this season, uh, obviously with the rivalry between Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark. Angel Reese is out for the rest of the season due to an injury. She is not playing in the game. For how much trash has been talked on, uh, on Angel Reese, she was a very important part of this team very important part of what they were doing all season long to their success. Her ability to just gobble up rebounds, get some good offense underneath, it's very important for them. They're also going up against a very good team in the Connecticut Sky. The Connecticut Sky are title contenders. They're 27 and 12, currently uh, currently up there in in the rankings. This is not going to be an easy game for the Sky. In fact, this is not going to be this is probably going to be the hardest one for out of all three teams and the sky have the hardest way to get in they don't have any tiebreakers over the mystics over the atlanta dream either they need to win and have the other two teams lose in order for them to get in at all they they only have a tiebreaker over atlanta not washington now, getting to Washington here, and Washington is a very interesting one. The Washington Mystics host the Indiana Fever tonight. Again, not sure if, you know, Caitlin Clark will be playing as they've clinched a playoff spot at 20 and 19. This is an important game for Washington. Caitlin Clark coming into town. It's, it's going to be, I'm not entirely sure how this is going to go, right? Again, it's very, very important that for 
the purposes of this game for the Washington Mystics. If Caitlin Clark is playing, I don't think they have a chance, honestly. The biggest issue for the Mystics all season long has been the fourth quarter. You take a look at what they've done. They've been leading in most of their games all season long. If you took a look at the box score, and again, box score watching isn't the greatest way to handle things, but you look at their games, they carry a lead into the fourth quarter most of the time. They just don't know how to close it. They obviously started off the season very publicly at 0-12, the worst team in the league. They've climbed They've climbed their way back up to, that, to a playoff spot, potentially, if they're able to close out with a win at home. Based on the Vegas odds, it's saying that the Mystics are going to get this last spot. Again, I kind of brushed over how these playoff seedings are going to work, but right now with the Dream, who have that spot right now up a game on the Mystics and the Sky, they're winning it if they're able to take down the New York Liberty. If they lose, it gets a little interesting. Obviously, if every single team loses, it's going to go to the it's going to go to the Atlanta Dream. Now, if the Washington Mystics win and the Atlanta Dream lose, the Mystics get in. They have the tiebreaker, which is head to head. If all three teams win, or sorry, if both the Sky and the Mystics win and the Dream lose, the Mystics get in. The Mystics have the head to head over both of these teams, three and one against the Sky. Once we get into the situation where it's going to be the Dream versus the Sky, where the Dream lose, the Mystics lose, and the Sky win, that's where the Sky get in. So out of all the possible combinations, obviously the Dream have the biggest chance to get in. Then the Mystics, then the Sky, based on tiebreakers. And based on how these games are going, a lot of them are going to be hinged on if the players in these in these games are playing or not. If Sabrina Ionescu and the rest of the New York Liberty are playing, if Caitlin Clark and the rest of the Indiana Fever are playing, how many of the Connecticut Sun are playing against against the sky here? It's going to be very, very important for that. And we're going to have to wait a little longer for the official starting players to come out. But I'm going to assume in this situation that no one is resting. I'm going to lean towards the Mystics to get in, and that might be kind of crazy for me to say, but taking a look at, obviously, home game isn't super important, but but it is a little important, absolutely. It's not something that we can just sit here and overlook completely. The Mystics are the only one of these teams that are having a home game. They're also hosting maybe the weakest out of all of these, actually definitely the weakest out of all of them. The Fever are a very good team. Caitlin Clark is very good. If you're comparing the Fever to the New York Liberty, if you're comparing them to the Connecticut Sun, they're clearly the worst of those three teams. I think if any team is going to be able to win tonight, it's going to be the Mystics. And based on that, they get that playoff spot. I'm very curious to see what happens, though. That would be one of the biggest comebacks in the history of the WNBA. Starting off 0-12 in a 40-game season, and clawing your way back to the playoffs is incredibly impressive, and that's very, it's, it's great for this Mystics team. Whoever gets this eight seed is going to get killed in the first round by the New York Liberty, most likely, but it's still really cool to see these all that, that a battle in the WNBA has so much attention on it in the media as we hit the final game of the regular season. It's really good for the league. I'm very excited to watch it, and the playoffs are coming up right around the corner. They start this weekend. So this is a very, very important game on the last day of the regular season in the WNBA. But let me know who you think is going to take home that eight seed. Is it going to be Atlanta? Is it going to be Washington? Is it going to be Chicago? I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on that. We're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, we are going to shift our focus over to the college football world and the Pac-12. We had our discussions about the Pac-12 bringing in their four members from the Mountain West so far. Now the question is, will they be considered a Power 5 school, and what will it take for them to be considered a Power 5 school if not? So stick around for that. We'll be right back here on Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. Sports Network. Get your fix of daily sports talk shows on YouTube. Absolutely free. NFL, college football, NBA, MLB, MMA, UFC, fantasy football, and so much more. 
GSMC Sports Network has shows running all day long, with new sports shows starting every two hours. Just like on your favorite cable sports channel, except GSMC Sports Network, it's absolutely free. Just search GSMC Sports Network on YouTube to catch one of your new favorite shows, like the GSMC College Football Podcast, Chip Shot Football Podcast, Boots and Heels Women's Sports Podcast, GSMC Basketball Podcast, and so many more. Check it out for yourself. GSMC Sports Network, now available on YouTube absolutely free. Search GSMC Sports Network on YouTube. Welcome back to Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Jeremy Lapidus. Today is Thursday, September 19th. If you are just tuning in, we just went over all the playoff scenarios for the final seed of the WNBA as that continues to be a huge drama as the final day of the regular season takes place tonight. In this segment, we're going to shift our focus over to college football. Another big question surrounding the Pac-12 will be answered here today. Will they be considered a Power 5 school? If not, what do they need to do to be a Power 5 school, and is that even a reality? But before we do that, remember, if you would like to be an even bigger part of the show than you already are, all you need to do is go to gsmcpodcast.net leave a tip or donation with a message in it, or if you are on YouTube, you can do the exact same thing with a super chat. If you do either of those two things, a message should pop up on the bottom of the screen for you, me, and everybody else around the world to see. If you do have a burning question about sports, anything at all that you would like to ask, go ahead and throw that in the comments. Throw it in the chat. I will get to it as soon as I possibly can. I appreciate everybody so much for sticking around, talking some sports with me here on a beautiful Thursday, September 19th. But like I was saying, in this segment, we are going to get into the Pac-12 and its future. Obviously, the messy breakup of the Power Five is something that's still experiencing ripple effects throughout the entirety of the college football landscape. Not just college football, but college sports. The Pac-12 is gone, split amongst itself along the rest of of the Power Four conferences, you have teams like teams joining the ACC, teams joining the Big 12, teams joining the Big 10. Not too many hitting up the SEC. I don't think the SEC wanted too many, but this is a this has been a huge fallout, leaving just two teams remaining, leaving just Oregon State and Washington State. And they have done an excellent job retooling, getting powerhouse Power 5 programs like Boise State like Fresno State, San Diego State, and a bunch of other sports. And, and this is a very good-looking conference, Colorado State as well. They're up to six teams. You need eight teams, though, to make a full conference. And they have a couple years before the Pac-12 officially dies in 2026, which is when the other four teams will be joining. There's a couple of questions out here. Why? Who, who else are they going to get? Because right now, as it stands... If we're answering the question, is the Pac-12 a Power 5 program? Is, is the Pac-12 a Power 5 conference? Absolutely not. There's no way that this is a Power 5 conference in my mind. This is a team, this, this is a conference made up of four group of five schools and two leftovers from a, from a Power 5 school. The, the pieces that nobody wanted in the Power 5. It's a little bit of chaos right now it's a little bit of hey why why were we left behind in the minds of washington state and oregon state power five programs for forever now relegated basically down to the group of five they're doing their best to rebuild the pac-12 and while they have the right idea of staying in the pac-12 as opposed to joining a group of five conference like the mountain west trying to rebuild it because the brand name is very important. Look, we talk about how college football is not a business, but it is. College sports are a business. The NCAA, while it's a nonprofit, is is a business, right? 
that's that's what it is. And brand recognition, these conferences are little pieces of the businesses. Brand recognition is huge for the Pac-12. Being able to get that TV contract, people see the Pac-12 and there's an air of legitimacy around it, which is kind of what happens with the rest of the Power Five, right? You see an SEC logo and you're like, oh, this is going to be better than if you throw up a Sunbelt logo, right? You see a Big Ten logo, oh, this is going to be better than an American logo. You know, you see the Pac-12 logo, oh, this is going to be better than the Mountain West logo. It's just the aura that these te- that these programs, that these brands carry with them, the Pac-12 still has, regardless of its weakness. So there is a shot in the dark here that the Pac-12 gets a seat at the table back with the rest of the big boys. Do I think it's going to happen? Absolutely not. I don't really see a world where with their strength of programs, regardless of how solid it is, it's a really good group of five programs. Really, really good group of five conference getting those six schools. It's not enough. You're not going to be able to lure any other power five schools back to the Pac-12. The only ones that might join are the ones that just left. The ones that literally just left to join the ACC, to join the Big Ten, to join the Big 12. They can't get back. They're not going to get that kind of money with the Pac-12 either way. They're also not going to get that kind of recognition by getting the top tier FCS schools. You know, you can try and get a North Dakota State, a South Dakota State. I, it doesn't seem like they want to move anyway. But if you go get other FCS schools, you're not increasing your chance to be rec- recognized as a Power 5 program. Now, an idea that's been tossed around, obviously, you go out and you get UNLV, that Las Vegas base. And the only reason they haven't done it is because state laws kind of tie Nevada to it. And from all reports, the Pac-12 doesn't want Nevada. Other ideas that have been thrown out there, UTSA, go steal Texas State from the Sun Belt, go steal Memphis from the American, go steal Tulane from the American, these really good group of five schools that are especially in college football, performing at the top. We take a look at that group of five, top five that I've been putting together. If they can steal, you know, Tulane and Memphis, they have basically the entire top five outside of Northern Illinois, in my opinion. You know, Wazoo, Boise State, Memphis, Tulane. Maybe you steal, maybe you steal a UNLV as well. Take Nevada whose basketball program isn't that bad if you have to, if you can get those two schools out of the American conference as well, it would be pretty solid. It would be a really good start for the Pac-12. I just don't see a path where the Pac-12 is back and they're welcomed with open arms back into the Power Four, especially with the way that the new playoff system is set up where each of the Power Four gets a bye. Now, it's just it's just not the same, right? It's just it's just not the same. The way they set it up is a way for them to only be those four conferences and they can change it. This is just a one or two year program trial run for this 12 team playoff. But the SEC and the Big 10, the two conferences really with all the power here, the only way they would change it is to make it more power for them and the ACC and the Big 12 have already ceded a good amount to them. They don't want to cede any more. We talked about it a couple months ago when all of this was first starting. This is a very tricky predicament for these teams to be in, and the Power Five, I just think, is no more. Maybe they can work their way up to it. Maybe we can have that kind of run where the way it works with that fifth conference winning is always coming from the Pac-12 or the future Pac-12. Maybe then they can look and say, hey, look at us. We're there with the big boys. Maybe they can get a win in the college football playoffs, but they need to make the college football playoffs this year, next year, and 2026 consistently for them to even start to have a conversation. There is a way because the brand of the Pac-12 is still strong. I constantly see all these people being like, oh, what if these 10 teams were all in the conference together with the former Pac-12 together? What if all of these teams got a conference together? They would be they would be 25 and 2 against non-conference opponents. They would be so good. Imagine if that happened. People miss the Pac-12. People miss the Pac-12 after dark, you know? Those kind of brands synonymous with the Pac-12, that West Coast powerhouse conference. It's something that is missing. The Mountain West is looking to fill that gap. It hasn't done it. The Pac-12 is going to rebrand and it's still going to be that West Coast power conference, but 
it's not going to be a power conference. And there isn't much they can do to immediately get their seat back at that table that I can picture in my mind. Again, it's something they can build up to. College football isn't set in stone. I talked about this when I was talking about the negotiations. There's a reason I don't like that the Big Ten and the SEC are consolidating all this power because there's going to be an ebb and flow. Eventually, the Big Ten and the SEC aren't going to be in charge anymore. Eventually, the Big 12 or the Pac-12 or something like that is going to take a big step up. Eventually, something like that is going to happen. Until then, this is the way it is. And the Pac-12 is going to have a very tough mountain to climb to get back to where it was just one season ago. But let me know what you think. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I just don't see a way where they get back into the Power Five. But again, love to hear your thoughts. Go ahead and put it in the comments. We're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, we're going to talk all about the NFL. Next two segments, back into the NFL. Bryce Young, benched. We talked about that a little bit. What's next for him? Is he going to get traded? Is he going to continue to run the scout team? Does he have a shot at starting in the NFL ever again? We'll talk about that and more coming up next here on Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. For the best and latest podcasts available anywhere, go to the podcast app on your cell phone and type in GSMC to access free content-rich podcasts on health and wellness, book reviews, sports, entertainment, relationships, social media, movies, technology, finance, and even weird news. Subscribe and download the GSMC Podcast Network's family of shows, available everywhere podcasts are found. Welcome back to Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. My name is Jeremy Lapidus. I am your host. <laughs> Excuse me. If you were just tuning in, we just finished going over the Pac-12, and if they have the hope of being a future Power 5 conference, getting back to their status like they were before. In this segment here, we're going to switch over to the NFL. Get back into it for these final two segments. Talk a little bit about Bryce Young and his future. Bryce Young was benched by the Panthers. Of course, we all know this. Should he get traded? What's next for him? Answer all those questions next. But before we do that, remember, if you would like to be an even bigger part of the show than you already are, all you need to do is go to gsmcpodcast.net. Leave a tip or donation with a message in it. Or if you are on YouTube, you can use that super chat feature. If you do either of those two things, a message should pop up on the bottom of the screen for you, me, and everybody else around the world to see. If you do have a burning question about sports, anything at all that you would like to ask, go ahead and throw that in the comments. Throw it in the chat. I will get to it as soon as I possibly can. I appreciate everybody so much for sticking around, talking some sports with me here on a beautiful Thursday, September 19th. But like I was saying, in this segment, we are going to get into the NFL yet again. Talk a little bit about the future of Bryce Young. The question being posed, should the Panthers trade Bryce Young, or rather, should Bryce Young request a trade from the Panthers? These are two very different things, because if we look at it from these two different perspectives, we're going to get two very different answers. Bryce Young, obviously, heartbroken, surprised by his benching. You can tell by the way he's been acting. He's taking it like a true professional, though. Reports out of Dave Canales today is that he was spectacular with the scout team today, and maybe this is the chip on the shoulder that he needs. Maybe this is, hey, I'm going to prove you wrong, get me back in the game that he needs, and maybe everyone's been looking at it wrong because he seemed like a broken man out there. That's just what's been happening. His confidence was shot. He didn't trust his pocket. Even in the rare occurrences when he did have it, he would bail out into sacks, throw bad interceptions. He just wasn't it. Maybe this is what he needs. There's different ways to treat different players. Players aren't a monolith, right? But the question of who or should Bryce Young request a trade is interesting because Andy Dalton while he is a very competent backup at 36 years old is not going to be the future of this franchise the Panthers most likely are going to draft another quarterback in this draft as they get a top five pick or as things continue to trend down 
the number one overall pick. Who knows? Maybe Bryce Young is done with the Panthers. But the Panthers, as far as trading him, it's an interesting thing. Because which teams would even trade for him right now? You can go down the list. Maybe you have the Giants trade for him. Bryce Young in a Giants uniform. Bryce Young versus Danny Dimes. I don't think that's much of an upgrade or a downgrade for either of those teams, right? For for the Giants especially, because they wouldn't the Panthers wouldn't take Daniel Jones in his contract. Or maybe they would. Maybe they would. Maybe I'm just out here spitting nonsense. But the the Panthers, but for the Giants, adding Bryce Young, it's not going to help him. The biggest issue with him is he didn't trust the offensive line. And going to the Giants is not going to help his trust in the offensive line. The weapons aren't much better over there. The run game still isn't an issue. He needs to go, if he's going to succeed, I think he needs to go to a team that's going to have a good run game, which brings up the second possible option, one that I think is kind of out the window now because of the moves they've already made in the Miami Dolphins. The Miami Dolphins are an interesting landing point for a guy like Bryce Young. Their offensive line isn't the worst, but it's not the best. They have a potent run game and the weapons. That's a situation that, as a quarterback, if you fail in, you're just not going to be able to make it. Skylar Thompson isn't a guy that I want to throw into any situation around the league, but if I throw him in with the Dolphins, I think he'll be competent, which is all you kind of need to be as the Dolphins quarterback. It would work down there. I don't think they're going to do it to solve their quarterback issue, they brought in Snoop Huntley instead. Now, I think we're having a much different discussion if Tua decides to retire. If Tua comes out after this concussion and says, actually, I changed my mind, I'm going to retire. Not something I think is going to happen, but I think probably should for his health, irregardless of that. If Tua says he's retiring, the Dolphins say, oh crap, what are we going to do now? We just spent all this money on a quarterback. What are we going to do? Maybe then they make a trade for Bryce Young. But unless that situation happens, unless Bright, unless Tua retires, I don't really see a world where Bryce Young goes down to Miami. Those are probably his two best options. Those are the ones I've heard the most. Maybe people have been tossing around the Raiders, but I think they're fine with Gardner Minshew right now. You know, people have been tossing around some of these teams that have bridge quarterbacks, but don't need a guy like Bryce Young. As far as the Panthers go, I don't think they're going to trade him. I think he's a good guy to have around as a backup, as an emergency plan, you know, in case something happens to Andy Dalton. Maybe he can get back in the game later. But he's in the, he, But if you're the Panthers, you're not going to get much for him. You're not going to be able to recoup your lost value. And that's really just, you have to go down with the ship on this one, you know? Uh there are, there are lots of different options. I think Bryce Young could still be a viable starter. I talked about it when he was benched. I think it's the wrong decision. I think Andy Dalton in the short term will be a better answer. But in the long term, for Bryce Young specifically, this is not a good move. We For the Panthers, you know, if Andy Dalton starts winning games, get them gets them out of that range of the best quarterbacks, do you really think they're going to be that much better? Is this a strong enough quarterback class that you're willing to win a couple games and, you know, throw out Bryce Young like that. Bryce Young, I think, is still needs to gain his confidence, and he can. I think the way that the coaching staff is talking about him, the way that he's handled himself, he can continue to be a backup in this league, just not with the Panthers. I know people have been drawing comparisons to Baker Mayfield. People have been drawing comparisons to Sam Darnold, both of whom are succeeding right now in the NFL. That's not the Panthers' fault. They came, to, they came to the Panthers as broken people, and the Panthers aren't going to fix a broken quarterback. The Panthers are not a team that's willing, that is in the right ability to fix a broken quarterback right now. Are they a team that will 100% produce broken quarterbacks? I don't think so. I think they're a team that's not conducive to success of quarterbacks, but they're not a quarterback, they're not a quarterback ruining factory, right? They didn't break Sam Darnold. They didn't break Baker Mayfield. The Browns and the Jets broke Baker Mayfield and Sam Darnold. The Panthers just didn't fix them. That's what it is. I think Bryce Young is a quarterback that in the right system could have thrived. He's dealing with a little bit of a disadvantage already. He's shorter. The offensive line is huge. It's tough to see over it. We haven't seen a lot of successful short quarterbacks in the NFL. Kyler Murray, Drew Brees are are great examples, but there's hundreds of other examples of quarterbacks that couldn't make it at the next level because they were too short. 
right? It's not a catch-all, but it is something that you're starting a step behind other guys at. So it's, it's one of those things that you just need to keep in mind when you're evaluating a quarterback like a Bryce Young. Should the Panthers trade Bryce Young? Probably. Are they going to trade E. Bryce Young? Probably not. Should Bryce Young ask for a trade? I don't know if he should. Maybe he should. Maybe he should test his luck on another team backing them up. But, I mean, right now, midseason... I hate to say it, but this is probably his only, this best chance to get back in as a starter. He's not getting in as a starter anywhere else right now, unless an injury happens. Then the Panthers should trade them. Then, you know, Bryce Young should ask for a trade. But until that happens, he should just sit back, try and get back in the good graces, beat Andy Dalton out, because I still think there's a world where he can do that. But let me know what you think. Should the Bryce, should the Panthers trade Bryce Young? Should Bryce Young ask for a trade? I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on that. We're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, we are going to focus on Thursday night football. Tonight, between the Jets and the Patriots. Spread of six and a half right now. We'll go through score predictions. We'll go through how I think this game might go and what all uh, and why things might happen. So stick around for that. We'll be right back here on Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. Welcome back to Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Jeremy Lapidus. Today is Thursday, September 19th. If you are just tuning in, we just finished breaking down whether or not Bryce Young should ask for a trade and whether or not the Panthers should trade Bryce Young. In this segment here, we're going to close out our show today talking, of course, about Thursday night football between the New England Patriots and the New York Jets. Aaron Rodgers and the Jets currently favored by six and a half points. We'll talk about my final score prediction, how I think the game is going to go, and who is going to win, of course. But before we do that, remember, if you would like to be an even bigger part of the show than you already are, all you need to do is go to gsmcpodcast.net. Leave a tip or donation with the message in it. Or if you are on YouTube, you can do the exact same thing with the Super Chat system. If you do either of those two things, a message should pop up on the bottom of the screen for you, me, and everybody else around the world to see. If you do have a burning question about sports, anything at all that you would like to ask, go and throw that in the chat. Throw it in the comments. I will get to it as soon as I possibly can. I appreciate everybody so much for sticking around, talking some sports with me here on a beautiful Thursday, September 19th. But like I was saying, we're going to finish off our show today talking all about Thursday night football. A battle, another AFC East battle for the second week in a row, this time between the other two teams, the Jets and the Patriots. The Patriots came into this year as arguably the worst team in the league as far as expectations go. They have a rookie quarterback in Drake May that has yet to see the field. Jacoby Brissett has done a very good job so far of keeping the football safe, which is why the Patriots have been in the games. They beat the Cincinnati Bengals in week one. They take the Seattle Seahawks to overtime in week two. This is going to be a closer game than I think people think. The Jets' defense has been disappointing, to say the least. The Jets' defense has been nothing like we expected the Jets' defense to be like 
when we thought when we were entering this season the jets defense in my opinion at least was supposed to be vaunted one of the best defenses in the league they lose jermaine johnson to an achilles tear they're still dealing with some other injuries cj mosley i'm not sure about his health for tonight that's going to be a big blow against an offense that really as long as they keep as long as they don't turn the ball over is good for 20 points a game and that's good enough to win a game if your defense is playing the way that their defense has been playing, if you're not playing against really good offenses, against offenses that make mistakes, and the Jets have been prone to mistakes these first couple of weeks, I want to say that's because of Rust, because they had maybe the second toughest camp of all NFL teams outside of the San Francisco 49ers, who also just took a tough loss against the Vikings last week. The Jets are in a tough situation. They're still in a holdout with the with the guy they traded for, Hassan Reddick. He is currently gaining more and more leverage. The Jets might have to bend the knee and sign him or just trade him. Either one. They can't sit here and have this drama continue because it's hanging over them like a dark cloud. As far as the offense goes, we saw some signs of life against Tennessee. Tennessee is a very, very good defense. I love that defensive unit they were able to put together, and Tennessee should have won that game if Will Levis wasn't doing what Will Levis was doing. We're taking a look at some of the most mind-boggling, mind-baffling plays that has po- that have ever taken place on an NFL field two weeks in a row from Will Levis. The Titans should be 2-0 and right now if they keep the ball safe like the Patriots do. The Patriots and the Titans, I think, are very similar. I think the Patriots have a quarterback that's not going to turn the ball over, but their defense is slightly worse, so there's a trade-off there. They're very similar teams in respect to how they're built and what you expect them to do week in and week out. The Jets almost lost to the Titans last week. And if we're going off of that trend, six and a half is way, way too many points. Now, the Jets offense continues to get better, continues to improve, but it's still not clicking on all cylinders. Garrett Wilson is yet to have that big game that everyone was expecting when he and Aaron Rodgers teamed up. Aaron Rodgers, while he's looked improved, has not looked all the way 100% back. And maybe that's because of rust, because he missed a bunch of training camp. Maybe that's because he's still recovering from that Achilles injury. I'm not entirely sure what's going to happen with him. Brees Hall and Braylon Allen look awesome as a duo coming out of the backfield. Brees Hall, obviously scary, but Braylon Allen at just 20 years old, the youngest player to ever score a touchdown in the NFL, he is kind of like a a carbon copy of Brees Hall in a lot of ways. They're both really fast, really good receiving backs that are big, strong, and, and have the ability to run over you. That's one of those really, really impressive things that you don't see that often around the NFL, that kind of blend of speed, power, and receiving ability. That's what the best backs in the league are made of, and they have two of them now. If that's how they're going to run their offense, that's how they're going to run their offense. The Patriots' run defense is solid. Christian Gonzalez is one of the best corners in the league, and he and Garrett Wilson, watching them go up against each other, I expect Uh, Gonzalez to follow Wilson around that's going to be a very very fun matchup to watch I'm not sure how this offense is going to look for the Jets and it's because of that uncertainty that I think I'm going to take the Patriots plus six and a half on this one as far as a final score prediction goes there's a lot of ways that this game could go right the Jets offense could come in and they could be that Jets offense that we expect same thing with the Jets defense the Jets could just live up to expectations like they had at the beginning of the season I don't foresee that necessarily there's a chance that they're very good I will say but living all the way up to that top defense with the injuries they have and the lack of a pass rush regardless of how bad that New England offensive line is New England has consistently looked better and maybe this is the week where everything flips on his head because I've seen a lot of love for the Patriots recently, but I'm taking the Patriots plus six and a half. I still think the Jets will win this game. It's going to be a tight one, but I think the Jets win this game. Aaron Rodgers and Garrett Wilson combine on a touchdown. Brees Hall also scores a touchdown in this one. I don't think as long as Jacoby Brissett doesn't turn the ball over, this game will be close. If Jacoby Brissett turns the ball over, the Jets landslide in this one. And that's really going to be the most important thing. Can the Patriots take care of the ball? I'm in. I'm of the mindset in the camp that they can. But there's also a real shot that they don't because regardless of how banged up and how poor this defense has looked, 
it's still a really, really good unit. Top 10 defense in the league. So we will see what happens. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this game. I'm taking the Jets to win this game 26 to 21. But again, let me know what you think. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you, everybody, so much for tuning in to today's episode of Sports by GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host. I've been your host, Jeremy Lapidus. We'll be back tomorrow with our game picks. Game picks for the top 10 college football games. One on Friday, the rest on Saturday, at least in my opinion. We're also going to go over every single NFL game pick, picking the spread as well as a final score prediction for you and breaking down Thursday night football. Stick around or tune in tomorrow for all of that. I appreciate all of you guys sticking around, talking some sports with me. Remember to tune in same time, same place for all of that and MLB Power Rankings, of course, every Friday. But thank you, everybody, so much for tuning in. I'll see you then. Have a good one. Bye-bye.